So I'm talking about surveillance. And uh, for those of you who missed it, I was saying that uh, surveillance has to do with relationship between knowledge and power. And uh, I think of it as systematic attention to personal details for the purpose of uh, control or management or influencing people and populations. Uh, it's neither, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's fundamentally ambiguous and uh, neither good nor bad and never ever neutral. I'm also, uh, from the title, saying something about uh, Edward Snowden, US citizen who uh, has achieved both fame and uh, notoriety since 2013 by uh, illegally taking and sharing classified documents about government surveillance from the company that he was working for, which was under contract with the National Security Agency. These things are all well known. I also want to say something about what I called the snooping scandal, or what has been called the snooping scandal. In many minds, Snowden has revealed surveillance out of control. I'm going to try to decode this somewhat. I do think that we are looking at surveillance out of control and that citizens have a right to be concerned about that. But I don't think things are nearly as simple as a mere snooping scandal. That is to uh, describe it in uh, the tabloid terms. And uh, I think that we have to go far deeper than that. One, of the, one part of the problem is that uh, things have been obfuscated by the use of certain words. Governments in the US, in Canada, and other, other places say, for example, that the collection of metadata is not spying or surveillance. I think it's perfectly clear that uh, the collection of metadata is very much what surveillance is all about. But beyond this, what is being revealed is may, may be seen as, I think, signs of a major transformation in governance. And that is to say, uh, both in the relationship between citizens and governments and in the relationship between states, um, there are some signs that I think have been reinforced by the Snowden revelations that suggest that uh, there is a major transformation underway. So I want, to, I want us to look, at more, look more deeply at what is going on and to recognize that surveillance has a history, very long history, and a context. Its main meaning is changing yet again. And that our responses are all too frequently, I'm going to suggest to you, rather shallow. And worse, may grow from the same soil that the surveillance grew from in the first place. So I want to give us some sense of what the big picture might be, what, what, why it is that we need a uh, history and a context. And uh, I'm going to try to pro provide a little bit of that. Having worked for a long time with uh, a, a number of colleagues and students in uh, Canada and in a number of other countries around the world, I've learned from them and through them various things about surveillance and uh, I think we, we can say that we, we understand some dimensions of surveillance anyway. Um, we just finished a collaborative project in uh, our center in, uh, at Queen's University. We've called it Transparent Lives, Surveillance in Canada. And it looks at key trends in surveillance. And uh, I think rather than looking just at discrete uh, technologies or techniques, which is important in itself, it's also important to try to get some sense of what the big trends are. And the book that we've just made, which will uh, appear in May, is intended to do that. Uh, the subtitle is Surveillance in Canada. That's just because we've used all our illustrations from the Canadian situation. The trends themselves could be examined in relation to any country in the world. And by the way, the thing will come out as a free PDF online as well as a regular book that you can buy. So um, look out for it. We're also starting some new ventures in our project which relate very closely to what the uh, Snowden revelations have shown. That is the acceleration towards the use of what is popularly called big data in the world of surveillance. Attending to the big picture, however, also means 
remembering that the issues are by no means trivial. They affect what we believe about the world and our place in it. How do we want to relate to each other? And how is this affected by our new media-saturated environment? I think these kinds of questions are raised by the Snowden revelations, and therefore it, it isn't just surveillance per se, it raises profound questions about being human in today's world. And I want to suggest how such questions can never be answered in a purely rationalistic kind of manner, and to create space for open dialogue between people from different, not only disciplines, but also uh, philosophical and religious positions about what is the common good. Our privacy and autonomy, two words that are frequently heard in relation to surveillance as somehow antidotes perhaps, or the alternative to uh, increased surveillance. Are they really the nub of the matter, as uh, liberal theory suggests? Or, as I believe, are freedom, dignity, and human flourishing closer to the mark? So let's think a little bit about what was actually leaked. And uh, by now, as you're well aware, the uh, leaking has been a steady drip since June last year, and therefore there are many things that we could talk about. Uh, I know about some of them, I understand about some of them, and there are others that, uh, uh, well, as you may well be aware, there are some things that were released even today that um, I certainly haven't had a chance to think through in any detail as yet. So from June last year, Snowden started to leak documents showing that the NSA, for example, gathers phone data on millions of Americans from the biggest telecommunications companies such as uh, Verizon. Soon afterwards, we heard about PRISM. And uh, PRISM is the code name for uh, a clandestine data collection and data mining program that's directly connected with the servers of Google, Apple, Microsoft, and others, and circumvents encryption and privacy controls. And one large and obvious thing that uh, many members of the public discovered through that revelation was that they couldn't actually trust what the internet companies were telling them about the protection uh, and security of their own data. Another system called uh, Boundless Informant, uh, which uh, is uh, illustrated on the screen uh, in front of you, records and maps where intelligence metadata come from. And its scope uh, from this raises huge questions about things like the frequent claim that uh, the NSA cannot keep track of all its surveillance activities. Boundless informant shows that not only do they keep track, but they are they're subject to constantly uh, updated mapping of the strength of surveillance uh, and the uh, density of surveillance, if you like, in different countries around the world. It's a very sophisticated real-time audit that continues, uh, that, 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 that is both persistent and uh, consistent. The metadata involved include things like the uh, IP address that gives away the country and the province or the state and often the city that the computer is in. Metadata, despite what is frequently claimed, easily reveals identifications, personal identifications, and other information as well. Some uh, researchers at uh, Stanford last year, with very minimal budgets, they didn't have any large research budget for this, took only hours to identify uh, Android phone users of uh, Yelp, Google Places, and other uh, systems such as Facebook. Uh, they had, with hardly any research outlay, 91 out of 100 percent success in performing identifications from metadata that it is frequently claimed is unidentifiable. Customers also discovered that without an encryption key, the NSA easily decrypts the most common cell phone cipher uh, A5-1 
as part of the G2 t uh, cell phone standard. So conversations, as well as met metadata, may also be targeted. The revelations have continued, as I say, through the, uh, through the past months. Uh, NSA secures what is called diplomatic advantage by spying on other governments and, and citizens of other countries, including close allies. And some of that, too, has raised uh, some critical questions in a number of countries around the world. Angela Merkel, for example, German Chancellor, uh, Dilma Rousseff, uh, the Brazilian president, and others have had their own personal cell phones checked uh, directly by the NSA. Uh, by December last year, it became clear that the surveillance of yet other governments, Israel for example, um, other corporations, Thales, Total, others, uh, NGOs, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, and others like it, all such surveillance, systematic, continuous, was revealed uh, in the documents that Snowden was making public. <coughs> This uh, has affected Canada as other countries around the world. Uh, for example, it was revealed in November last year that the Canadian government allowed the NSA to conduct widespread surveillance in Canada during the G20, G8 uh, summit in 2010. The US Embassy in Ottawa was actually the command center for an NSA operation which was uh, doing systematic surveillance on Canadian citizens, not permitted by our own version of, C of the NSA, which is the uh, Communications Security Establishment of Canada. So CSEC, uh, unable to do, or not doing anyway, what uh, they obviously wanted to do, which was uh, do surveillance on Canadian citizens, simply had the NSA do the job for them. Um, and leading lawyers have uh, shown how that was actually a completely illegal move. And, and so it goes. There are, there are many other ways that we can uh, look through what it is that Snowden has been revealing. And uh, in all of them, uh, I would argue that there is a debate that needs to happen that we should be discussing and arguing about these sorts of things. You can discuss whether Snowden is a hero or a traitor, if you like, but really the important thing is to discuss what is being revealed and what its implications are for our own uh, citizenship, our own uh, being consumers, being travelers, all the other ways in which surveillance is so easily conducted. That debate is often couched as uh, being about the difference, the balance between civil liberties and uh, national security, about the scope and protocols of un U.S. Uh, government surveillance, about the relationship between the NSA and internet and telephone companies. All these things are part of what the debate should be. Uh, web infrastructure, national sovereignty, the meaning of privacy in a world in which Big Brother could be listening. Or we could ask, uh, again, I want us to refer to some bigger questions that I think are raised by this. Will social trust or suspicion win out? Or even, is politics as we once knew it still possible under the new circumstances that are being revealed in part through what uh, Snowden is leaking? So I have another question. How does digital data make a difference? Well, there are various things that we could talk about. In a world of large scale and uh, networked communications and computer databases, surveillance is front and center. Developments over the past 35 years and more uh, since the invention of the silicon chip particularly have been increasingly rapid. The pace is accelerated, uh, accelerating. We've moved quickly from a situation where uh, the searchable database became central through networked information capacities to today's mobile real-time surveillance based on transactional and communication data, every purchase, every phone call, 
Uh, and now we talk also of big data that analyzes data on a colossal scale using very complex algorithms, some of which, uh, which, which some see as another uh, qualitative shift. So what is the digital difference? Well, one, surveillance is not a special and discrete activity relating only to espionage and uh, intelligence gathering operations. Rather, surveillance has become a basic way of operating within all contemporary organizations. Collecting personal data and analyzing it and using it for different purposes is the way all organizations work. Ask your administration at uh, UC Irvine. That's exactly how things happen. Yours, like every other campus, is profoundly surveillant in, in a number of interrelated ways. So that's one important point to make. Surveillance is not just a special, the special case of um, intelligence and uh, espionage. Another point. Uh, since the, the story that starts since the silicon chip should be stretched even further back. Such changes in surveillance and its technologies have been occurring since at least the uh, middle of the 19th century. And of course, surveillance has always had some kind of technology, even if it's um, you know, curtains and keyholes that we uh, see in Shakespeare plays. But Looking back to the 19th century, um, telephones, phonographs, typewriters, cameras, telephones, all those new technologies from the 19th century were producers of evidence in, way, in uh, modes that did not exist previously. And so I'm suggesting we have to look back and see today's technologies as growing out of older ones rather than simply saying, oh yeah, it was computers that made all the difference. Not so. And then also these changes have never occurred on their own. And especially the new technologies, uh, whatever they are, they don't move according to their own logic. No, the silicon chip itself was uh, a product, a child of the Cold War years, and must be understood in that military industrial context. In fact, the political economy of surveillance reveals that the commercial forms of surveillance, uh, what people in business schools call marketing, is in some ways predated by high-tech intelligence surveillance and they've been adopted for government purposes. Uh, and, and consumer surveillance itself has a, a very, very long story, long predating uh, the development of database marketing in the 1980s. Your grandparents and great-grandparents were already uh, named in ledgers of major US stores uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century. Then there's what I think of as a kind of future tense shift, and uh, I think tenses are very important in this context. One major way that digital data make a difference is that they help to shift surveillance from a past to, uh, or a past or present, into a future tense. That uh, pre-crime department in uh, the film Minority Report, or that uh, sense of anticipating what's going to happen in person of interest, those kinds of uh, filmic and uh, TV uh, accounts actually give us some clue about this shift in tenses. The Department of, Social, uh, Department of Homeland Security frequently talks about connecting dots. And uh, connecting dots, they argue, entails gathering more and more data wherever it is available and uh, also where it previously, previously was not available. And in holding on to it as long as possible, just in case. So the CIA's chief technology officer, Gus Hunt, says this, since you can't connect dots you don't have, 
we try to collect everything and hang on to it forever. He was speaking in the vernacular. And this raises issues for such things as fair information practices that uh, include notions like informed consent, for example, that underlie data protection and privacy legislation in many countries around the world. And of course, simultaneously, it helps to create subjects and therefore also undermines the, pre the presumption of innocence. I think to get through, I'm going to miss one or two things that you'll see as points on the screen. Um, let me say something about digital dreams. North America, by which I'm referring primarily to the US and Canada, seems singularly prone to what I call digital dreams, although such dreams also exist elsewhere, to believing that more technology is better and that technology will somehow provide the answer for most human problems. That, of course, is why so many tech corporations describe their products as solutions, so much so that they tend also to shape the problems that they supposedly solve. One of my colleagues at Queen's, uh, Vincent Mosco, just dubs this belief in the power of technology as the digital sublime. Ways in which a myth of techno power becomes dominant and supports the uh, political and economic growth of those new technologies, even when challenged by events such as 9-11. What do I mean by smudged sector surveillance? Well, one last little comment in this part uh, that relates to a major surve surveillance trend. Public and private progressively blend and blur into one. I've hinted at this already in my reminder that the last century was the period in which uh, commercial forms of surveillance, including after the 1980s, database marketing and so on, have been technically ahead of policing uh, and intelligence surveillance. But this trend has intensified in recent decades, such that it's now hard to tell who exactly is doing the surveillance. Uh, after 9-11, the first port of call for the newly formed, actually before DHS even fully came into being, they first went not to the FBI or the CIA or to the NSA for ideas about how to uh, locate and track down terrorists. They went first to CRM. Now, CRM may not be uh, a policing or intelligence agency that you have heard of. CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. They went first to the commercial sphere because they believed that there they would find superior technologies to those already existing within uh, the organizations I just mentioned. So how do we know what is public and private anymore? They work together very, very closely indeed. Those everyday, mundane, transactional and communications data that are gleaned by internet companies and telecoms, that uh, it's those bits of data that are sought, are sought most avidly by the NSA and the CIA, for that matter, in the US uh, and by equivalent organizations in other countries. Does all this sound somewhat Orwellian? Well, many people, including Snowden, think so. Snowden himself uses the uh, language of Orwell and refers to Orwell and uh, Orwell's ideas in 1984 especially as the metaphor that kind of guides his actions. It certainly sounds as if things have moved too far, too fast and without any public knowledge, let alone uh, assent. But things also seem to continue. It seems to be business as usual. There has been a very strong outcry in some countries, such as Germany and Brazil, but at most only muted public protest in some other countries, including the US and Canada. You may have been aware of the, uh, the day we fight back on February the 11th, uh, which was a very interesting global um, outpouring of uh, arguments based on the Snowden revelations against 
uh, government surveillance. But that was just one item. It was a very well-coordinated and interesting um, way of drawing attention to the issues. But really nothing has happened uh, after it. And in fact, I would say that even the response to that was somewhat muted. Although it may be that uh, what was revealed today uh, through uh, uh, Glenn Green Greenwald's work uh, may give us some clue as to why the impact of that uh, did not, uh, didn't seem so obvious. Okay, let me move on. I think we went past two there. Yep. So what are the effects of government surveillance? And I'm using the qualifier just to remind you surveillance is not only government surveillance related to intelligence and policing. Surveillance itself is far broader. These are specific kinds of surveillance that I'm referring to. So firstly, the effects are to create suspects on a mass scale. And Snowden himself argues that this is the effect he hoped to expose through his disclosures. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have read Dave Egger's novel, The Circle, uh, which is a Northern California story, but uh, I commend it to you as a really interesting novel that uh, relates directly to uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. It's a corporation called The Circle. It's in Northern California, and they have already taken over uh, Facebook, Yahoo, and a, a Google, and another number of other corporations. But the author of uh, The Circle says, uh, says this, and he is, uh, as it were, paraphrasing what he thinks of as uh, US government defense. First of all, he says, we're searching everyone's home, so you're not being singled out. Second, we don't connect your address to your name, uh, so don't worry about it. All we're doing is searching every home in the US every day without exception, and if we find something not noteworthy, we'll let you know. In the meanwhile, proceed as usual. So that's his somewhat satirical way of uh, describing what is happening here in the States. Judge Leon's decision in December 2013 uh, came down to this, quote, I cannot imagine a more indiscriminate and arbitrary invasion than this systematic and high-tech collection and retention of personal data on ev virtually every single citizen for the purposes of querying and analyzing it without prior judicial approval. He added, surely such a program infringes on that degree of privacy that the founders, founders of the US, enshrined in the Fourth Amendment." End quote. So, Create suspects on a, uh, on a mass scale, first. Second, it creates cumulative disadvantage. You are well aware, I'm sure, that uh, the category of Arab and Muslim is one that uh, became, after 9-11, an intensified usual suspect category. Um, and you see it even today that when there is some um, discussion about some terrorist cell or some uh, terrorist plot or whatever, you find frequently that journalists call on, quote, Islamic experts, regardless of what nationality or what uh, country of origin the person concerned is from. And so that kind of stereotyping that gr grossly uh, expanded after 9-11 is uh, certainly experienced by many uh, who might fall into that category uh, of Arab Muslim. And of course there are notorious examples of major egregious mistakes. Mistakes, well, that have been made since 9-11, uh, one of whom is a Canadian citizen, Meher Arar. Um, he was uh, seized on a return from uh, a visit to his um, parents in Tunisia in uh, 2002. He was uh, taken from JFK, tortured in Syria uh, through the Extraordinary Rendition Program. After that, it was proved that he was entirely innocent. 
He was almost a year undergoing torture in Syria. He then, after his uh, being proved innocent, won a $10 million compensation from the Canadian government for their part in having passed some uh, information to uh, American authorities in, uh, at, at JFK. And this person has never, ever been exonerated by the US. He's still regarded as a terrorist. Such things happen. And that is to do with a cumulative disadvantage relating to certain categories that have been expanded out of all proportion subsequent to 9-11. Thirdly, chilling effects is another uh, outcome of the kinds of government surveillance revealed by Snowden. Remember the Penn report of uh, prominent writers around the world that uh, produced a petition uh, to address to the UN in, uh, in December 19, uh, 2013. When polled, those writers said that um, it, it was disclosed that 88% of writers polled were troubled by the NSA. 24% say they actually avoid certain topics in emails and phone calls, let alone what they actually write. 16% said that they abandoned a project that they were working on because of its, the sensitivity that they imagined it might have. There were 562 writers around the world who signed that petition, Writers Against Mass Surveillance, in December 2013. So the chilling effects, quite apart from the direct effects on the lives of certain people who suffer from cumulative disadvantage, and from the uh, general creation of suspects, is enormous. And in the light of all that, you wonder why we go on with business as usual. Doesn't it strike you as odd that we have such incredible tolerance for what is happening anyway, but now being revealed step by step by Snowden. Why do we tolerate it? Let me suggest three reasons why we tolerate these things. Now, there is plenty of evidence about the widespread complacency about government-initiated mass surveillance along some thoughtful and sometimes active questioning and resistance. Interestingly enough, in October 2013, a poll showed that Canada, within Canada, the US, and, and uh, Britain, Canada was in the lead for approving Snowden's actions at 67%, to the UK 60 and the US 51%. In the UK, only 52% said that internet monitoring by government should be tolerated, compared with 60% in the US and Canada. And interestingly, in that poll, it was shown that very few trust their government with their own personal data. UK, 7%. US and Canada, 5%. But then why do we tolerate it? One, I think, is that we've become familiar with everyday surveillance. We're used to having surveillance around us in so many ways, so many contexts. Not just the obvious or not so obvious video cameras in the street, shopping mall or school, but in the very buildings, vehicles, and devices that we use from day to day. I sometimes ask students why they carry PTDs around with them all the time. Um, PTDs are personal tracking devices, uh, apparently issued to all students, but they all carry them anyway. Uh, they're marketed as smartphones, but, <laughs> well. And so we get used to them. We just live with these familiar devices. They're domesticated, normal, unremarkable. We don't notice them. Secondly, fear, especially after 9-11. Government, security companies, and the media have played on the fear factor. It's a winner for corporations who are trying to sell Equipment for governments that see their task as allowing market forces freer reign and their key role as maintaining security 
<coughs> and for the media, that depends on polarizing good versus bad, Americans versus terrorists, or whatever, without clearly distinguishing, be, distinguishing be the, between those who really are terrorists or who have terrorist inventions and others who may be legal protesters against environmental degradation, human rights abuses, or Aboriginal exploitation, or undo uh, undocumented migrants. That fear has been ramped up hugely since 9-11, and it's a crucial factor, I think, in why we tolerate surveillance. Thirdly, fun. And here I'm thinking primarily about social media. The implications of surveillance after 9-11 and the rise of social media occurred at the same time and in many ways have turned out to be mutually supportive. User-generated content is, the, uh, is what marks social media out from other forms, um, underlies what was called, uh, or so-called, Web 2.0. But social media works not only through user input, but through relationships between different users. Facebook friends being the most obvious and most pervasive. What was previously done at great cost and uh, intensive labor is now done by us. We do the categorization. We do the sorting of ourselves as we choose who to include or not as our friends. So what's really at stake in all this? Firstly, it seems to me the digital dragnet simply denies democracy. I suggested that there's a, a new relationship developing between state and citizens, and Snowden himself says that it's a far cry between legal programs, legitimate spying, legitimate law enforcement, where it's targeted based on reasonable suspicion, individualized suspicion, and warranted action, and the sort of dragnet mass surveillance that puts entire populations under a sort of eye and sees everything, even when it's not needed. I don't agree with all the things that uh, Snowden has uh, said, but that is one of them that uh, I think he's quite right about. So the kind of democratic expectations that we might have of our governments, I think, are being undermined by what we are seeing from uh, the Snowden revelations. Maybe this is something we could uh, discuss in the question time. I just want to move forward. Uh, privacy is provoked, is privacy the problem? Well, what exactly is privacy? Uh, I suggest that the sorts of things that we understand by privacy, particularly in uh, its legal incarnation, is quite inadequate to the sorts of issues that were confronted with the dragnet surveillance uh, that is clearly occurring in this country and others. But secondly, that other values are also very much at stake, to do with accountability, to do with rights, uh, and particularly, as I said earlier, to do with freedom and dignity. There are many things that we could say and discuss about privacy, and that, I think, is something else that we could uh, talk about in, uh, in the question time. But there is one other thing under this head, and that is that um, Government and corporate surveillance goes far beyond what uh, I've been talking about in terms of those general rights to privacy uh, and uh, di even dignity and freedom. It's this. It's the ways that data are used to distinguish between different groups in the population. Assisted by our self-clustering social media activities, for example, and by algorithms that are intended to classify with more and more granular precision. And these reflect social differences and divisions within, with which we're all too familiar. And this is what I call social sorting. And to many of us, I think it's a hidden dimension of surveillance, especially when we think only of invasions of privacy or some violation of our own person. The social sorting that occurs is also tremendously significant. And so, if I ask what is really at stake, I think there are big questions to be asked about democracy, big questions to, to be asked about whether privacy is really an appropriate way forward, or at least privacy on its own. 
and uh, to ask whether we've ever thought about the way that categorization has such a, a profound effect on certain groups, especially those who are more vulnerable, marginalized, and disadvantaged. So as I say, the so-called snooping scandal is more than just a temporary blip from which the status quo will soon be resumed. It raises basic questions about how we live in a digital data-driven world, encourages us to demand that we know more about what these corporations and government agencies are doing, and invites us to interrogate what we mean when all we ask for is more privacy. The Snowden revelations, I think, do more. They challenge human flourishing in some profound ways. Edward Snowden has had the courage and the temerity to speak up against unnecessary and excessive surveillance. Remember from that quote, that last quote I gave you from him, he is not against surveillance. He's against unnecessary, illegal, unwarranted, and excessive surveillance. Who will speak up with him for these uh, kinds of values that I have been arguing for? Dignity, freedom, and human flourishing. And as I say, they affect particularly certain uh, vul already vulnerable groups. Whatever you think of what Edward Snowden has been doing for the past few months, the issues that he has raised are far too important to ignore or to return to business as usual. Myself, I think we should ask ourselves how far we are prepared to think with and speak out with Snowden. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start, uh, start taking my questions. The first one I noticed was right at the back here. Yeah, you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you're talking about how uh, social media is a very powerful tool in regards to surveillance. Yeah. Uh, how likely is it that the You, you ask how likely it is that they're using social media? Uh, it's not just likely. The evidence from Snowden shows that it's exactly what is happening. Um, social media, as I say, depends on user-generated content. Therefore, the uh, content available on social media comes from us, the users. And uh, it's all based on relationships between those users, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever uh, system we're talking about. And the kinds of data that are available through social media are ones that uh, indicate how the, um, how the clustering for consumer purposes in the first place, because that's how Facebook and the other corporations work, by collecting those data and selling them. But it's not just raw data. It's already sorted by us in our choice of who we have in our circle or our friend network or whatever it is. And so the, the data that is there is very valuable for profiling, for determining uh, the likely characteristics of people in uh, one group or another. And as I say, we do the sorting. And so uh, it was clear from PRISM, for example, that uh, social media were being used extensively. In fact, uh, only four years after um, Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook, in 2004, by 2008, there was a definitive uh, acknowledge from, acknowledgement from the Department of Homeland Security that they were already using uh, Facebook data for their purposes. So it's, it's a long-term thing. It's not just the Snowden revelations that reveal it. Uh, it is, it, it's seen in other contexts, too. So the use of social media by government agencies is uh, is huge, and in fact, the revelations that uh, are emerging today about uh, through Glenn Greenwald using Snowden again shows how um, the uh, government can use and is using social media in order to deflect attention 
from certain things that become tremendously important within social media uh, and then can be reduced in importance through various guises using what are called, um, what are those things called? Sock puppets, which are fake uh, IDs on social media in order to flood um, social media with other messages which deflect from that which is actually trending. And it's when there are things that are deemed to be uh, negatively critical of government that government steps in in this way. The other thing that they do is um, use what are called um, counter, counter resets. And in that case, they step right in and reset the counter so that you can't even tell how the trending is occurring. <coughs> and uh, what is deemed by social media users as being important. Uh, that sort of thing was happening in the Arab Spring as well in responses to social media. So don't imagine that social media is not profoundly involved in everything that I've been talking about this afternoon. Yeah, there's a question over here. On, on, on data, data what? Sources. Oh, sources. Yeah, you mentioned maybe that there was a center that was aggregating data on the different levels of surveillance at each different nation. Yeah, there, 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 there's work going on in, in various places. It's curious to me that um, in the US, there are one or two Canadians who seem to get invited to the US. I'm not quite sure why this is happening, but I have a colleague in Toronto, and uh, his center, which is called Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, uh, is, uh, is doing very interesting work on actually tracking empirically what is happening with uh, these forms of data collection that uh, are being revealed through, uh, through the Snowden uh, leaks. So his name is Ron Debert, D-E-I-B-E-R-T, and uh, Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto is, I think, tracking this business more closely than anyone else except the NSA themselves, which, as I told you, boundless informant, they're doing the work. But uh, Ron Debert is, is doing that as well. Let me change sides of the room, shall we? Uh, what about right in the middle with a white t-shirt? Yeah. Well, this is a huge subject that you've asked me to talk about this afternoon. There are many things that I don't know about this. And uh, in a context where I know a lot of you are involved in uh, international studies, that's exactly the kind of thing that I think would be a really interesting you know, set of projects for, for you guys to think about. I'm basically slipping out of answering that question because I have no idea why that should be. However, um, it must be said that the network, the network intelligence, the intelligent networks, intelligence networks around the world have been developing throughout the 20th century and especially after the Second World War. So that the so-called Five Eyes, for example, was a key example of that. And that was the link between Britain, Canada, uh, the US, U, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. So English-speaking countries. And... Um, so that was, a, that was a tremendously important kind of backbone of global surveillance. Uh, but who has been the major player in that and who has uh, kind of slipped down the ranks and who's, uh, um, which governments have really known what was going on within that? I mean, there was a time, for example, a notorious moment when uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand declared on being newly elected that he would never allow American intelligence to operate on New Zealand soil. And in fact, it had been operating on New Zealand, New Zealand soil for years and years. So how far people know what's going on is another question within that. But yeah, it's a, it's a very complex picture. And um, yeah, to ask a mere sociologist is to take me a bit out of my comfort range. So here with the pink shirt. Okay. Are, are you hearing people's questions? 
Okay, so that's about how uh, NSA connects the dots. Now here's, this is a really interesting question, not that the others weren't, but this one's as interesting as the others. Um, basically the, the aim, the belief, is that the use of certain carefully worked algorithms can sort through the massive amount of data um, in order to provide uh, relatively reliable results in pinpointing certain groups and uh, individuals who might be seen as a quote threat to national security. That's the kind of way that they uh, say they operate. But it must be said that quite often if you talk with people, for example if you talk with people or listen to people who are uh, also whistleblowers, it's not as if Snowden was the first whistleblower, there are others who've done uh, whistleblowing as well. And if you listen to those people, Bradley Manning and um, Thomas Drake and, and others like that, you discover that they, while they are very concerned about what's going on, which is why they turned to be whistleblowers at all, they also point out the extent to which mistakes occur, the extent to which uh, agencies sometimes have no real idea of what they're doing with the algorithms, that they experiment in ways that uh, indicate a sort of um, ad hoc approach. And, and I'm not meaning to uh, demean or discredit the work of the people who are involved. I have colleagues and I know people who work on those kinds of algorithms and they're sincerely trying to uh, eliminate forms of terrorist threat and so on and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm not demeaning it, but I'm saying that you have to acknowledge that the technologies don't always work in the way that they should. People make mistakes, the algorithms aren't necessarily correct, and so on and so forth. So the, the aim is to find algorithms that will, in fact, produce the results that are wanted. But increasingly, uh, the argument is made, and you heard it from uh, the uh, CIA, uh, person that I quoted, that we simply have to collect more and more data. But they were already acknowledging, by they I mean the Department of Homeland Security in this case, uh, in, by about 2005, that the amount of data that was being collected in the post 9-11 uh, effort to eliminate terrorism was simply creating gluts of information that they did not know how to deal with. So it isn't a straightforward kind of zero sum uh, or every attempt to do surveillance of this kind really works. It doesn't always work. And uh, it's important to remember that too. Oh my gosh, we're going to be here all night. Where should we go now? Down here. Well, that's unfolding as, uh, as, 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 as we go. Um, and and the, the, yeah, the governments have had different approaches to what has happened. Obviously, some governments have been um, appalled to discover that they are, uh, or that their citizens, or that their uh, government officials, their presidents, or prime ministers, or chancellors, um, have been subject to intensive surveillance, which they did not know about and of which they would not have approved had they, uh, had they known. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's very hard to tell. Um, governments do not want to, uh, well, obviously they were secretive in the first place about what they did know in terms of their already existing agreements with uh, NSA and so on. Um, but they, th there's a, a sort of holding pattern that's developed at the moment, I think, where uh, governments are not really, and unless they've been directly affected in a way that they believe is negative for them, they are aware that they are also engaged in various forms of espionage. And don't forget that it's not only kind of anti-terrorism or um, looking for um, uncertain aspects of people who they believe are their allies. It's also corporate and commercial surveillance. This is a tremendously important part of what's being revealed by the Snowden leaks as well, that it's government and corporation frequently working together. 
So, uh, and when economic, um, when negative in economic aspects have been revealed, then that also tends to encourage putting the lid on uh, what's actually being discovered. Um, in some countries, governments have been obliged to uh, make some comment or respond in some way. So for example, in our, in our own country, in Canada, um, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association has launched a, a lawsuit against our equivalent of the NSA. And so th they're going to have to answer in court about their uh, collaboration with the NSA. So in that case, the, the government's going to be obliged to face up to some of the issues that have been raised. And uh, similar things have happened in other countries, some European countries. There have also been lawsuits that have been launched. But um, I also think that governments have been somewhat shocked by the extent of the revelations. And uh, people are still wondering what is going to come next. Um, it's going to be, seem awfully invidious answering these questions. What about down here with the white t-shirt and gray hoodie? So your question has to do with whether these uh, agencies have actually succeeded in, yeah. Well, you know, I, th I think that um, each of the agencies that are being discussed, and particularly the NSA, which obviously is the main um, nub of what uh, Snowden is all about, each of them has uh, uh, had different things revealed about them. And they're in their origins, they have some, uh, the intentions of founding those agencies has generally been to try to uh, protect, uh, in, in the case of the US, the US from certain kinds of uh, possibilities of attack or negative, um, uh, negative action taken by some, uh, nameless other. Um, and so you have to acknowledge that there are some important things that are enshrined in the um, mandates of organizations like the NSA, CIA, and, and so on and so forth. But you know, here, we're in a university. And uh, we should be very concerned, I think, to look at the actual histories of what has gone on within each of those agencies and see what their origins are. Because sometimes their origins actually reveal something about their uh, present activities. Take the CIA, for example. Uh, this, the founding of the CIA in the US has everything to do with uh, American activities in the Philippines in the 1890s. And uh, it was actually setting up the Philippines uh, uh, National Security Organization uh, by the Americans and trialing some new ideas there that led to the foundation of the CIA in the US. And so it began with a kind of colonial uh, approach to uh, national security in another country, and the techniques that were developed there came back to the States. So you have to understand where it came from in the first place, because then you can understand some of the ways in which they operate. And uh, my wife and I have just spent a week in uh, Guatemala, and there you see what the CIA achieved notoriously in uh, 1954 in overthrowing the uh, presidency of uh, President Arbenz. And there are long stories, long histories that we need to explore before we can make kind of definitive statements about whether the activities of this agency are somehow uh, appropriate or not. It's embedded in historical uh, 
uh, yeah, the origins of these agencies. And I think those need to be explored and exposed so that we can understand why they operate the way that they do now. And I believe, speaking as a citizen, in my case of Canada, but on your behalf, uh, demand accountability of these organizations um, far beyond what has been demanded so far. Um, okay, so the um, sort of grayish t-shirt. Yes, you. Uh, professor, you've been talking a lot about the um, consequences of and reaction to uh, government surveillance. Yeah. But has there been any similar blowback to the corporations and organizations that the data originally came from? Why are we less afraid of their surveillance than the government surveillance? Yeah. Well, I, I think partly for the reason that I started to give, um, as you probably noticed, I cut short what I was going to say about uh, consumer surveillance. Um, but you know, the, the fact is that when Amazon tells you that um, uh, you might be interested in certain other books that uh, match the interests that they already know about, it's, it's actually pretty interesting. And uh, you think, yeah, I might add that, that book, I never knew that existed. I think I'll buy that one too. It's actually rather handy that uh, these corporations have the capacity to uh, know about our interests, tastes, preferences, proclivities, commitments, and so on and so forth. And I think we see the benign aspect of it only. We see the benefit that we get from Amazon and Facebook and so on and so forth, and we don't think critically about the business plan that lies behind it, um, or the fact that, well, I don't even think about the business plan at all. We don't think about the fact that the reason these corporations exist is to make massive profit from selling personal data that we insert into the system ourselves. We think more about the benefits to us. And so in some ways it becomes far more difficult to explore critically what's happening within those corporations. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a hard time both with uh, uh, devices and, and systems that we use and with the actual benefits that we get from engaging with them. So I think that's part of the reason why there is a, a very muted criticism of uh, corporate behavior. Um, oh, so many more things we could say about that. So it's, it's a great question. Let's move on. OK, here with the uh, white stripe on the black thingy. Is this surveillance still going on, or is this being caught? Have they stopped? Is it still going on? Yeah. Uh, it is continuing at an accelerating pace. From all that we are hearing, there are very obvious trends. As I say, the, the little uh, book that we made in Canada, which is called Transparent Lives, the one that I was mentioning that comes out in May, we're looking at some of the, the main trends. And each of those trends uh, suggests that the ways in which surveillance is developing at the moment are ways that are going to be amplified and, uh, uh, and magnified in future. Now, some may well you know, become less important relative to others, and who knows, if you're dealing with trends, they are just that, trends. Um, but I see no sign of uh, um, surveillance being any, any less relentless than it is at present. What is, what is clear is that there is at least a larger proportion of uh, populations of a number of countries around the world that are taking a more critical interest in what's going on just because the Snowden revelations have been and are being so dramatic and so spectacular. Uh, they have captured the interest of uh, mass media uh, opinion and so on and so forth. And that, it seems to me, is an opportunity an opportunity to say, yeah, let's, let's ask these questions more profoundly. Let's discuss them together. As I say, this is a university. This is one of the few places where we can discuss freely and uh, critically what is going on. And so, you know, I, I commend that process to you, but I think it can happen in all kinds of contexts too. Like I say, in Canada, there are lawsuits that are being launched. Uh, the day we fight back was precisely about uh, Snowden revelations and how it's affecting countries around the world. And, you know, for all that it didn't apparently 
and this is what I was meaning about uh, the muted response to the day we fight back. I, now that we know what we know from Glenn Greenwald today, it could well be that counter resets were involved in reducing the social media interest in uh, you know, specific revelations. That is perfectly possible. So yes, it is continuing. And all kinds are continuing too. So um, uh, yeah, I, w I was, uh, last few days I've been with some colleagues looking at uh, surveillance in Latin American countries. There's a little network of Latin American scholars and it's perfectly clear that although some of the kinds of surveillance activities are somewhat different from what's going on in the US and Canada, that um, surveillance activities are growing at a very fast rate, both public and private, of both public and private situations. Brazil, for example, with the uh, Olympics and the World Cup coming up is going to be a prime site for testing new surveillance technologies and it's another story altogether. Okay, we'll go, go back to the middle here. Maybe I should have someone nearer to the front. What about you? Um, you people at UC Irvine have some really good questions. Um, this, is, this is another excellent question that we need to think about. There's a recent um, article by uh, Giorgio Agamben, which uh, I think touches very neatly on this. For those of you who have had Agamben on your reading lists, you might uh, sigh impatiently and think, I'm not going to try to read that abstract stuff again. Let me just tell you, this is not like other Agamben readings. This was a lecture that was given in Athens last October or November. It's a very interesting one because for once, the Italian philosopher actually comes down to the level of empirical realities and things that are actually happening in the world of biometric surveillance, in the world of video surveillance in public places. It's a very interesting argument and, and he, I think, has put more clearly the argument that what the Snowden revelations are showing is that the very possibility of politics as we once knew it, democratic politics that is, as we once knew it, is becoming less possible. That is to say the conditions for politics are becoming less easy and they have a direct relation to the development of surveillance, particularly that which is under the sign of security or national security. And so what he's saying is that what these new uh, techniques do is to take our attention away from the causes of the kinds of problems, whatever they are, crime problems or uh, national security issues, they take our attention away from the causes of those and focus only on the consequences. Like I was saying, it's future tense. It's trying to prevent things before they happen. And, um, and also, of course, it's bad news for social sciences and humanities. If we're not interested in the causes anymore, then, hey, there's nothing for us to do. Um, the new techniques tend to push forward to what the consequences are. And those consequences just have to be managed. So the dis-ease or the disorder or whatever it is just has to be managed. That's all you do. You don't have to worry about the causes, about dealing with economic disparities or uh, with uh, social inequalities or whatever. You just manage the consequences. And so what Agamben is talking about in relation to these new forms of surveillance is a shift away from politics to policing, away from governance to management. And uh, it's, it's, it's a neat little lecture. I don't agree with the whole lecture, but it uh, raises some very interesting points about whether the very conditions for democracy in the 21st century are being undermined by the, well, what I would see as the, um, or an, another face of which I would say is the uh, replacement or the supplanting of the rule of law by some notion of security. So um, have a look at the Agam Ben piece. You can find it online. It's on several different sites. And uh, it's, it's a, very little, a very good little argument to debate and discuss. In your a last question. A last question. Well, there's a last 50 questions here. You choose then, Kamal. I, 
go ahead. <laughs> okay. What about right up here with the um, jacket? Yeah, you. How it began or how, how it began. yeah. OK, well, it actually began with, um, uh, I, I, I became very interested in, uh, I kind of ask for the trouble of big questions because I'm really interested in the big questions. Um, I started being interested in the so-called information revolution or the microelectronics revolution in the 1980s following the invention of the silicon chip. And there were lots of people talking about the ways in which you know, the world was going to be a better place and uh, all sorts of human, social, political problems were going to be solved by the development of uh, these new electronic technologies. And so I came into it that way because I was questioning just how far they were true. I wrote a book called The Information Society Issues and Illusions. And in that book, I got to what I was writing as chapter five. And chapter five, it turned out, was all about surveillance. And uh, I thought as I was writing this book, I, the book, well, it's OK. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stand by what I've written, and I'll let it be published. But what I'm really interested in is chapter 5 and the stuff about surveillance. And I began to realize just how far the conditions for, uh, for life in the advanced societies were changing as a result not of the technologies, but of the social and political and economic forces that were guiding the direction of development of those technologies. And uh, you know, if there's any message you've heard this afternoon, then that's a really important one. And then as I came into surveillance questions proper, I realized that I was facing some issues that touched my own convictions, my heart as much as my head, um, that I realized were uh, were ones that I should and could be passionate about. And uh, especially around things like social sorting, for example, that matter of cumulative disadvantage that occurred. I mean, I mentioned our Canadian friend, Mahar Arar. But uh, it's also true in the, in the consumer sphere and consumer surveillance. It is OK if you are well healed and, you have, and, and you're uh, you know, a good consumer. If you are not, you suffer cumulative disadvantage. Those who are already marginalized, those who are already vulnerable, are made more so by the overall system of database marketing and uh, uh, yeah, all the things we've been talking about in relation to social media and so on. And I realized that we were dealing here with issues of basic justice and human dignity. And um, these were things that struck me very deeply. Um, many, yeah, I, I, I've been happy for many years to uh, stand in the uh, Christian tradition. And I, I actually kind of left the faith of my parents, which was also Christian. But I realized that there were some tremendously important things there. And so my own commitments and my own life, I realized, were affected very profoundly by what I was studying. And uh, it seemed to me, and that's why I, I tried to ask some of the questions that are bigger than just Snowden, to ask about human dignity and human flourishing. Privacy, for example, is uh, in its legal form, it frequently relates to very abstract entities, disembodied persons. Uh, it doesn't reveal, it, it doesn't refer to the real world. Uh, Julie Cohen has a great book about this stuff. And uh, moreover, it generally is um, associated with the reduction of harms or mitigating harms. And I'm thinking there's far more going on here. Should we not actually be thinking of how whatever we do in the surveillance field could not be thought of in terms of pursuing human flourishing. Do we really have to stop with mitigating harms? It's important in its own right. But it seems to me there are far bigger questions that we have to ask. And that's why I you know, plead with you to think about those bigger questions. So that's the way I came to surveillance in the first place. And I've been driven along in it by uh, 
new commitments that I discovered, both to careful critique of uh, the origins of new technological developments, a concern about the cumulative disadvantage that is created by uh, new surveillance methods of all kinds, um, the fascination of looking at how what I now call the culture of surveillance has developed that sort of relates to the question over here because it's not just as a surveillance state or that we live in a society that is uh, suffused by surveillance that we can call a surveillance society. I think surveillance society is now inside us. We are Big Brother. We do it ourselves. We do it on social media. We do it when we set up our own uh, home uh, video surveillance systems. We are now doing the very same things. And I think understanding the culture of surveillance that has developed also helps us see how we end up complying rather than questioning what's going on. Thanks for your question.